Why don't you take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians. We continue our sermon series, Home Improvement. And uh, last week was Husbands, Love Your Wives as Christ Loves the Church and Gave Himself for It. Uh, Today we're on the other side of that and we're preaching about wives. Submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. So if you would take your Bible, stand to your feet, and listen as I read to you our text for today. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24, and verse 33. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now the King James Version says what? uh, Everybody's got that down, don't you? Wives, be subject to your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now look at verse 33. Nevertheless... Each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects, there's that word, did you hear that this morning with the children? That she respects her husband. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Did you know, I looked this up, did you know that uh, for $40, you can rent a wife. Did you know that? There are franchises of this company all over the United States of America. Okay? The company was begun in Petaluma, California, by a person whose name is Karen Donovan. She first launched her business in a local newspaper and uh, it later expanded her operations to include her husband. She recruited her own husband to begin a branch of her business called Rent a Husband. Okay? The husband part was to take care of work outside, painting, repairs, and the heavy lifting jobs. While, the, uh, while Karen's job was to, um, was to run errands, balance checkbooks, decorate homes, pick up and clean up. That was the rent a wife responsibilities. Later on, she recruited her teenage children and she called their franchise Rent a Family. Rent a Family. The slogan of the company is... We can do what any family does. And she muses by saying, We can come over to eat all your food, turn on all the lights, put handprints on your walls, take showers, and leave the towels on the floor, just like any family does. Of course, when we're finished with you, you'll have to call Rent-A-Wife to come by and clean up all the mess. For 40 bucks. That's less, uh, 40 bucks an hour, that's less than it costs to mow your grass. All right? Pretty good bargain. The Bible says, Whosoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor, blessing of the Lord. Proverbs 18, 22. Now, I don't think the Lord in Proverbs was talking about rent a wife. Do you? The most remembered scripture about wives in the Bible is found in Proverbs 31, 10 through 12. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. There's no need for rent-a-wife, y'all. 
when a virtuous woman is in the house. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. You know what the writer of Proverbs is talking about there? He's talking about the value. Far above rubies, far above pearls. There is no comparison to the value of a virtuous wife. She's a rare find. The right one is worth everything. Remember the parable Jesus taught about the pearl of great price? You remember the farmer just happened upon it and he hid it and he went and sold everything that he had and came back in order that he could pay the price for this wondrous pearl that he had found. What Jesus is talking about there is the worth and value of the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is worth everything. It's worth all we have. And that's what the writer of Proverbs is saying here. That's what he's talking about. He's saying a good wife is priceless. She is incomparable. Now, how did she get that way? Now, if you look at verse 30 of Proverbs 31, it gives you the answer. Verse 30 of Proverbs 31. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. That's where her value comes from. It's the kind of wife, the virtuous wife, that worships and reverences God. She loves Jesus and she serves Him with her whole heart. Lydia was that kind of wife. Remember, Paul met Lydia down by the river at Thyatira in, of Macedonia. She was an industrious woman. She worked hard. She was a seller, the Bible says, of purple goods. In other words, the elite of the community were her customers. She had an uh, a unreproachable reputation. Purple was the color of royalty in that day. And it is said of her that she worshipped God. And after hearing the gospel preached by Paul, she was baptized together with her whole household. What that means to us is is that the church of uh, Macedonia, the Philippian church, was begun, was started in in her home with the support of her family. She threw everything she had into the work of God. Isn't that amazing? A virtuous woman who loves God and works hard for Jesus. When you look, it's like looking in a mirror. When people look into her face, they see the image of God looking back at them. Now there are three kinds of virtues that Paul tells us about that are a part of the character of this kind of woman, a virtuous woman. The first one is that she is submissive. She is submissive. That word in the New Testament means to place or to rank. It is a military term of someone who yields themselves to the authority or position of another. Most translations render what the NIV translation does, and that is subject or obey. Now this suggests a deliberate decision, a conscious choice to yield one's own self-interest and self-will for the sake of another. In other words, you choose to be submissive. You're not made to be so. You're not coerced to be so. You choose that as a way to live. Subject yourself to another. Now, subjection is part of life. Mark that down. Write that down right now. Take your pencil. Write it down. Subjection is a part of life. Right? 
The Bible says we are to be submissive people. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, you're not subject to the will of the pastor. You're not subject to the will of the board. You're subject to Christ, who is head of the church. We are to submit ourselves unto Jesus. Okay? That's what this altar is about. Uh, uh, When the Holy Spirit moves upon our heart and convicts us of our sin, we submit ourselves, we come forward and we subject ourselves to the person and ministry and love and care of Jesus Christ right here in this place. Right? We are to be submissive unto Christ. Workers are to be subject to their bosses. Did you know that? Servants in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. You got, you're right out ahead of me. To the good and to those that are not so good. You are to be subject to your boss. It's healthy to be subject, especially at work. <laughs> right? Do you know that citizens are to be subject to the ruling authorities? The Bible says so. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but God. The powers that be are ordained of God. In other words, we drive within the speed limit most of the time. We honor the stop signs. We follow the law as good citizens. We are subject to the higher powers. Do you know that we are to be submissive to one another? Uh-oh. Listen to what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yes, all of you be subject one to another, And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Having a submissive heart is evidence of humility. It's okay to give a seat to someone who is needing a seat. It's all right to let another person lead out and have a bit of responsibility. We are to be subject to. One, do you know that submission is a fact of life? It happens around us all the time. Just the other day, I was preaching a funeral downtown, and I was on, it was on Saturday morning, I was on my way to the funeral home, and there was this long line of traffic that I got caught behind, and I was afraid that I was going to be late getting to the funeral home, and I got stopped right in front of Popeye's Chicken on Jesse Jewell's Parkway. Stopped right there, dead, in this long line of traffic. And coming out of the chicken store was this guy in this car. And I was afraid that I was going to be late. And you know what he did? He stopped and he just started inching his way out. And when he started inching his way out, he wanted to get in my spot. He wanted to get in front of me. He started inching his way out. You know what I did? I started inching my way up, you know, and there we were. We were inching and inching and inching, okay, until finally, good old me, I submitted, and I waved at him as he went in front of me, made me one-tenth of one second later getting to the funeral home than I would have been had I been able to go as I had planned. Now what if your home worked that way? You take an inch, I'll take two. And there we are, inching our way along. You get your way, you better give me my way. What if there wasn't anyone in the home charged with the responsibility to teach these precious little ones 
what it means to be submissive. You're talking about responsibility. You're talking about a glorious calling in the life of every wife. I want to tell you right here in this verse might lie the secret to world peace. What if politicians and leaders of nations learned how to subject themselves one to another? Had a mother in their home that would teach them the glory of yielding yourself for the good of another. What a glorious charge. Ladies, pat yourself on the back. What a glorious charge the Lord has given to you in terms of your calling, in terms of your position. Now men, you can't make your wife be submissive. Don't even try. You know, it won't work. Because it's a matter of the heart. Uh, Submission happens internally before it ever takes place externally. It is a matter of the heart. Someone has said the most precious possession that ever comes to a man in this world is a woman's heart. This kind of submission you want, the kind of submission that comes straight from God through your wife's heart. We're not talking about a weak or a spineless, milk toast, wimpy kind of cowing down to another person. Oh, you just, you just go ahead. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the kind of support that is better understood as a partnership with your wife. Where she first of all gives herself unto God and then through her heart comes the will of God. And the work of God unto you. It is an all for one and one for all triad. You, your wife, and God working together for the good of your home. I heard one godly wife say just recently. You know, I didn't agree with him on that. But I went along with him. Because I wanted to support him. You know. That's what we're talking about. That's what it means to be a submissive kind of wife. You support him anyway. Right? I, I could have our ladies raise their hands this morning and say, how many of you have supported him anyway? <laughs> and there'd be hands going up all over. Right? You submit yourself. That's the first quality. The second quality is that you look up to your husband. Verse 23 says, The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Now, I'm going to talk to you husbands for a moment. Uh, Your wife has been called to be submissive unto you, but... The Lord says you are to be head of the wife just as Christ was head of the church. Gave himself for it, right? Headship bears extreme responsibility. You know? Not talking about uh, authoritative or coercive headmanship. What we're talking about is that kind of responsibility that, that takes uh, full care for that which God has given you in your charge. Let's examine this just a little bit. Jesus Christ is head of the church, right? You give that to me? Amen. Jesus Christ is head of the church. So what has He done? He is responsible for the life of the church. Because that's his charge. He's head of the church. He is responsible for the life of the church. This is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is to fill this place up. 
Because he is head of our church. Jesus bears the burden and the responsibility for the sustaining health and well-being of Grace Baptist Church. It's not in our hands. We trust Him for everything. So is the husband charged with the responsibility of care for his wife and his family. I once served on a board of trustees. And in Georgia law, a trustee bears, I mean it's written in Georgia, not for profit law. A trustee bears the responsibility of care for the organization over which he has that burden, that care responsibility. In other words, the health of the entire organization is in the hands of the ones who have been elected and appointed to trusteeship. And uh, in terms of Georgia law, you could be taken to court. If you abuse your authority, if you assume more authority than you should, or if you neglect the body over which you have been assigned care. Right? Now you think about that. Jesus Christ assumes the responsibility of care for Grace Baptist Church. Willingly, gladly, He saved us all. And He empowers us all. He indwells us through the Holy Spirit. But uh, bottom line is the buck stops there (laughs) with Jesus who has that responsibility of care. Do you assume the responsibility of care over your family like Christ does over the church? Now listen to this one. He is responsible, Jesus is responsible for the growth of the church. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Jesus is growing us. Kind of evident, isn't it? Uh, It's not the fact that we got out and sweated buckets of sweat yesterday and washed cars and changed oil and that sort of thing. I mean, you can get that done anywhere in town. Okay? Uh, The difference that was made yesterday was because we did it in the name of Jesus. You know? We did it uh, for a a much deeper and more more glorious uh, purpose. And that is to share Christ. Uh, Our prayer was that people might see Jesus in us yesterday as we washed cars and changed oil. That's what it was about. He is growing us. Not only is He growing us larger, He's expanding us, but He's growing us deeper in Christ. Jesus bears that responsibility. Jesus feeds and nourishes the church. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. We're growing up in Jesus. He is, he is nourishing us through the preaching and teaching of His Word. He is growing us, not only expanding us, but He is growing us together in fellowship, in unity. He is responsible for the nourishment. Someone has said, let God make a man out of him before you ever attempt to make a husband out of him. What Paul is saying here is that a husband who is head of the wife, now qualify A husband who is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. Who has that duty of care. Who is at work inside the church growing it and nourishing it. So the husband grows and nourishes. A husband works for the well-being and the health of the entire household. A husband who has done his part deserves that respect and that submission that comes from a loving, caring wife. You agree with that? This is the reason 
Uh, this is the reason uh, to look up to your husband. It is not because he's taller. It's not because he's louder or stronger or braver. You look up to him because of the load he carries. He has an extreme responsibility of care. Husbands, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to be like Jesus, you take care of your wife. And you take care of your your family. Wives, if you want to be like Jesus, you support your husband anyway. You look up to him. You follow his lead. Just like a faithful church walks in the footprints of Jesus. A real man puts God first. Only a man following Jesus knows how to properly lead his wife and family. I talked to you about this last week. Husbands, it's not your wife's responsibility to bring you to church. It's your responsibility as head to bring your wife and your family to church. To lead them in the study of God's Word. To lead them in prayer. It's your duty of care in the name of the Lord Jesus. One final point. Show Him respect. That's the reason I did the children's sermon on respect this morning. Show Him respect. The the word is phobite. And we get our word phobia. It means to fear. There is, you remember what Paul said? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out what? Phobia. It casts out fear. We talked about fear in Sunday school uh, this morning a little bit. 1 John 4, 18. The Amplified Version translates this this way and it adds a little bit to it. I like what the Amplified Version says. Listen. However, let each man of you without exception... Love his wife as his very own self. This is verse 33. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers him, praises him, and loves him and admires him exceedingly. Ladies, did you get all that? (laughs) I like what Ogden Nash wrote. He said, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving, whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. (laughs) Maybe respecting... One another at home is knowing when to say the right thing and when to say nothing at all. James Dobson has done some work on this. He quotes Cliff Notarius and Howard Markman who did some study with newlyweds over the first decade of their marriage. They discovered that couples who stayed together uttered five or fewer put-downs per every 100 comments made to each other. Now go home, get your piece of paper and keep yourself a ledger. Okay? Couples that inflicted twice as many verbal wounds, ten or more per every 100 comments, did not last. You know, submission and headship has a lot to do with what comes out here. Did you know that? Why? Because what comes out here starts right here. Right? You're careful about what you say and how you say it. The Bible says, let all the earth, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in respect of Him. Why? Because He made it all. He is the sovereign God. He is above all. He is in all. 
And He uh, is our God. And we reverence and worship God from the heart. You, when you're careful about what comes out here, it's because God is taming and bringing under submission and control what's going on in here. Right? And if you can't do it at home, where can you? It's the first place. That's what Paul has in mind. When husbands do their part to love their wives, to, to do their duty of care for their families, to honor the Lord, it is a natural response for their wives to look up to them with respect and honor. I want to tell you, if your husband is doing his best, why not? Why not yield? Why not give the second and third mile if he's working hard and doing his best? There's a story told of Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt when he was still a general. He was boarding an airplane don't know where he was headed. But there was a young soldier waiting in line at the ticket booth. And of course, the general being the rank that he was, he got all of the, all of the uh, prestige and he got all of the uh, accolades and he was ushered right into the front of the line. And this young private that was wanting to go home, he said, before I'm shipped overseas, I want to see my mother one more time. And he said, I'll have to fly to be able to do that. And the tick person behind the counter at the ticket booth said, uh, the, the flight is full. You'll have to wait till the next flight. This flight is full. And when uh, Brigadier General Roosevelt heard that, he came over to the ticket booth and he said, he can have my seat. And a, a lesser officer who was accompanying the general said, sir, uh, that's not right. It's a matter of rank. And Theodore Roosevelt said, that's absolutely correct. The Lord Jesus gave the position of sonship higher rank than he gave to a brigadier general. And so he gave his ticket over, submitted himself. Now, wives, you know that you're really in charge, don't you? <laughs> you know that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. I want you to know that. You know that? You are. But it really doesn't matter, does it? Because you, like the general, willingly give your rank, your position, in love, in respect, in care to everyone else but you. <laughs> right? You give, you give the best to them. You give your seat in order that they might have what they need. Now, I don't know how the Lord Jesus has spoken to your heart this morning. I want to tell you, I prayed over this sermon all week long. You don't, you don't tackle a Bible word like submit and not pray. I want to tell you, you know. Are you glad you came to church today?